Atomic Bomb, William Onyabor. So this is the album that started it all, really. I was in Paris looking for records, the flea markets. I would go there probably once a month at that point in the early 90s, looking for African records. And this just obviously, I, you know, just caught my eye instantly. Stopped and I was like, well, what the hell is that? Who the hell is that? William Onyabor, who is this guy? Obviously, you know, if you see uh, an album called Atomic Bomb for a start, with synths and a guy showing off his kind of studio prowess with the uh, eight microphones. And you think, well, I'm probably onto a winner here. It just sounds so unique. It's that there's nothing else that sounds like it. And obviously, the use of synthesizers were just insane. It was like, well, this is, this sounds so modern. This sounds like, it's a, for me, it was like, well, I, this is exactly the kind of music I would love to be able to make. It's not like any other music, and the guy isn't going to tell you why, where it came from, where how he was able to make it, or what was he thinking about when he made it. A lot of people made a lot of speculations about this young man without getting clues. It's hard to get into the man's mind, and that's probably part of his genius. I think you probably find it's quite hard to, uh, to get facts out of people. <laughs> the first time I heard his music was like a total revelation because this is a gem, you know, this, this is something that's rare that doesn't happen all the time. Nigerian independence. From then on, colonialism in Africa was, for all intents and purposes, history. The English left behind the concept of one nation, a common language, English, and a government structure based on the parliamentary system. The task now? to combine the many different traditions and make Nigeria real. One of our great statesmen said Nigeria is not a country, it's just a geographical expression. When the British came over, they tried to create this country by putting together all these tribes that had no business being together, that had no shared history. Trouble among the emerging nations. Nigeria's rebel eastern state the Republic of Biafra declared its independence, setting off an unofficial war. Most of the East was utterly destroyed during the war. It was just scorched. The Nigerian Civil War lasted from 1967 till 1970. One thing that kept people's spirits up was music. You had a lot of young people forming rock and roll groups. There were the Funkies, the Hikers, you had also the High Grades, the Wings, the Apostles, Semicolon. Those were the main ones. There were some other groups that were a bit more amateurish. Oh wait, the Figures, the Figures, that was a big group as well. And the Postmen, and the Silhouettes. We used to listen to radios, we used to hear uh, rock groups play. In fact, most of the things that happened during the war was influenced by James Brown. They were into the Western music, the sort of experimental psychedelic rock and the blues and the soul music. But they, they took it all and they just mashed it up with their own, their own styles. At this time, Nigeria had just found oil, so there was this big boom. You could buy records everywhere. All the big companies were in Nigeria. That was Polygram, EMI, Decca. Records were selling big time. Back in about 2000, there'd been a sort of wave of interest in, in African music, especially after Rafael Kuti had, had died in 97. We started to piece together a, a compilation called Nigeria 70. I just realised there was this rich mine of music in Nigeria and Western Africa of uh, musicians that had explored US R&B and mixed it with, with traditional music and uh, it's made some incredible fusions. That's uh, where we first found out about William Onyabor. The 
the track was called Better Change Your Mind. It's this sort of very trippy extended piece. America, do you ever think this world is yours? Eh? And you, Russia, eh, yeah, do you ever think this world is yours? Nothing sounds like Mini Money Ball. It's like nothing that was really uh, being heard in Nigeria at that time, you know. The bands were still playing day in, day out, high life, Afro beat, Afro rock. Willie took it to another dimension by using synths. To use them how he did, you know, that's an extraordinary thing. To come up with what he did, we had to program the bass line, the drum patterns, you know, I mean, that took a lot of effort. And you can hear that in the music. tunes are almost like sort of finding out what you can do with the instrument as they're recording it. You know, it's sort of, you can feel it's like, oh, right, okay, right, we'll do that with it now. It's quite sort of uh, eccentric, but it's also very intelligent and incredibly funky. <laughs> The first time we heard William Onyabar was on Nigeria 70. Um, the song was Better Change Your Mind. It was the most unusual track I had heard from Africa. And when the opportunity came to do a, a, a larger compilation of his work, I mean, it just seemed so perfect for us. So I kind of asked around, well, who, how do I clear this stuff? Uh, we knew Chenna, who had a blog called Komen Razor, and he was going back to Enugu, his hometown, which is also where Onyabar was from and he offered to uh, license the tracks for us. Sometime in the late 90s, I guess, it became kind of popular for DJs to look for uh, African records. Nobody knew anything about them. And you know, I would look at these things and say, oh, I know that, I remember that very well. Somehow people just started looking to me as the guy who could provide some context to these records. The first time I remember hearing William Onyabo was in 1982. He had a record called Hypertension that was somewhat popular because uh, hypertension was becoming a bit of an epidemic in the country. He was seen as kind of quirky. You know, he had that album cover with him surrounded by all these keyboards, which at the time just seemed like something out of Blade Runner. He was just a very weird, futuristic kind of guy at the time. Even people who knew about the entire scene knew very little about Onyebo. A lot of the other musicians had all, had all played on the same circuit together. They'd all toured, they'd all played the nightclubs together, they all done the same circuits year in, year out. So they knew each other, but very few of them had ever come across Onyebo. Yeah. There was one story that we knew about Onyebo, which is that he had gone to Moscow to study filmmaking. He'd moved back to Enugu and he uh, started a film company and made a movie called Crashes in Love and the soundtrack for the movie. He had his own recording studio, his own pressing plant. So, I mean, this is the story I've been telling everybody. This kind of story would kind of always change. You know, we'd have this story that he was a filmmaker that studied in Russia. And then we'd meet someone and they'd say, oh, really, I didn't hear that. I heard that he was a lawyer that studied at Oxford. So like there'd always... Conflicting stories. Always conflicting stories and we'd never really know like what's up, you know, what's the, what's the truth. I guess I've been playing his song when they're going is smooth and good in my DJ sets and people always respond, people always cheer like they know the song really well. The thing that sets 
his use of synthesizers in his later music of art is that he's using sequencers and drum machines to create this kind of perfectly robotic loop and using repetition as a primary element in making the music, which was an idea that was definitely happening in, in dance, the kind of beginnings of dance music. He was just kind of developing um, the same kind of ideas that were happening at that time in the United States, but independently. He clearly had a singular, singular vision. I don't think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know of anybody else who was doing something similar to this in Nigeria, or even really in Africa at that point, that is so obviously, uh, you know, wanting to be identified as electronic music. The setups that the major labels, like EMI and DECA had at the time, they were still recording with eight tracks. So when you look at what this guy had, he was well ahead of the major labels. Synthesizers were a luxury in Africa. You know, anyone will tell you that. They were expensive, they needed a lot of maintenance, they were not something that bands used because they were problematic. I mean, what, what interests me is what, what's his economic context? Where did he get his money from? And where did he get these cents from? I mean, you're not going to nip down to the local store in Nigeria and buy a lot of that stuff. I'm interested in finding out, personally. There was a fellow who was an active commenter on my blog whose name I recognized from some uh, old record sleeves as uh, having been a bit of a presence in the music industry at some point. So I asked him whether he could help me find some people. I gave him a long list of artists I wanted to look for. And, you know, to my surprise, he had William Onyabo's number. I didn't expect that at all. But he told me, be careful. He's kind of a tough customer. So Uchenna gives me Onyabar's number, and I decide now's a good time for me to call him. So I, I call him up, and he picks up the phone, and I go, hello, Mr. Onyabar. It's so exciting to be talking with you. And he kind of grunts, and, and I say, you know, we'd, we'd really like to, to, to find out more about your history and how you made the music you made. And he goes, why would I want to talk about that? I just want to talk about Jesus. And he hangs up the phone. And I was like, uh, you know, that didn't make any sense to me. What, what is that all about? We'd go through these phases of why we thought that he didn't want to talk, why he wanted to stay anonymous. We heard so many stories that would lead us to think that he's got such a dark past that he doesn't want to go into it. Right. We'd always heard he was a really difficult person and that he was, in fact, dangerous. <laughs> We're getting ready to put the record out, but we still have no idea who this guy is. Especially now, when we're so used to being able to go onto Google or, work or online somewhere and finding pretty much out about anything we want to know about, here's something that you can't find something out about. That's totally mind-boggling. Was that tune where he's singing about, you know, I'll tell you how, I, t I, I tell you how wonderful you look all the time, you know, how great you are. Why don't you just tell me how great I am, you know, just for a change. And then there's this, 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 this it sort of stops, there's this sort of bubbling of synthesizers and then this, this woman just goes, you look so good. fantastic man. It's a sort of slight humour to it. It's not unrealistic. And it seems like that's very much than his nature, isn't it? He's just not interested in all the bullshit. He's just doing his own thing. Which inevitably makes us all more, all the more fascinated to find out who he really is. I'm DJ Patrick, an old school master. I'm also a dancer when I was young, but I don't dance now because I'm old. Let me just demonstrate. Just that. That's disco. I have a lot of records, ranging from high life, pop, disco, calypso, and everything. 
Everything you need about records, you can find it here. Richards, TP, this Godoku, and the hybrid. Lionel Richie, Isaac Hayes, Ray Parker Jr., Ray Parker Jr. Do you like William Onyebo's music? I like William Onyebo too. There are some Onyebo music at the corner there. He classifies himself apart from Sonny Okosu, who play pops and the race. But he himself went different for that, creating his own sound entirely. When we go in. I can't remember exactly the year now, but I guess it was in the late 70s or early 80s. Um, at that point in time, I was doing covers for Polygram Records. Out of the blue came this music from the East, and they said the artist is William Oyabo. You, you just can't miss it. Every record store in town, all the jukeboxes, you know, so to speak, were blasting it. He stuck out like a sore thumb. This guy, he composed the music, arranged everything, produced himself, all synthesizers, Nenugu, and he became a monster hit. I used this a number of times on my shift, on my show, and I never got tired of it, you know? I never did. Hmm. It was a drop bomb in the music scene that actually just rippled out. It was certainly groundbreaking. I have been a Kraftwerk fan, and for me it was like, you know, <laughs> he was doing something similar to what Kraftwerk had been doing, but clearly in his own way, and combining our own traditional, uh, should I say, our own Nigerian context to an electronic format. No one, as I knew, as far as I knew, was doing anything that avant-garde. It had constant airplay. You know, the video had constant, it was constantly being played. There are people who had, who had some knowledge of him, but then no one actually had anything to say about his personal nuances. It was, it was more a question of, oh yeah, I saw him drive past, or I went to his studio and we saw him in passing. You know, so he was practically, he was all around us, but really nothing was known about him. The first time I met him, I didn't think that he was colorful in any way, but he just, he had talent. He loves electronics, and he had seen that he wanted to do music electronically. He had the finances and he wanted to have control. And he built a pressing plant and had a studio in place and everything. He was the only one at the time who was an artist who had those facilities.
first met William? What was he like? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a nice guy, quite all right, but his antecedent make people to get scared of him. A boy that sat me in the shop sang for him, and the boy claimed he wasn't paying him royalties as Aunt Wendy and maybe accordingly. He went to William. And he claimed William drove him off with a, a pistol. So he went for the police. When he came back, the police sought, uh, sought for the pistol. They didn't see the pistol. And the guy was charged with false information to the police and sentenced. That image, an air of a bully, was floating the air. In a place where you have uh, bad guys, somebody can you know, have, develop an image which will suppress any fraudulent you know, intentions. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, it does not mean the person is a guy, bad guy. Uh, I worked with him. I had never had any problem with him. Not a very bad guy, though uh, a hard uh, character to deal with anyway. <laughs> but it was int- quite interesting. I knew him when he was um, doing uh, wheel films. films. And you know he's a giant. He, he feeds once a day. And when he's eating once a day, he will eat up uh, the food that uh, about three or five people <laughs> will not consume. Uh, he tried to organize films but he couldn't do it. It was when he ventured into music that he had a breakthrough. I say what he used mostly then was uh, the Moog synthesizer. not that general approach to the local funk of the era. He charted a new course. He was said to have come all the way from uh, one of these uh, East European countries. He was said to have brought this in, as, as, uh, from abroad while coming back. The rumors were that he had sponsors Russian sponsors who gave him the money, who gave him the equipment to come back with, or the money to buy the equipment. And he had some big boys there, and that's really what was said. The context of a big boy in Russia in the 80s is different from the context he would, he would put it post Gorbachev. Because the big boy in Russia obviously meant he had communist apparatchik sponsors, which is probably felt like absolute nonsense. Sorry, I mean, this is, what, this is a man that's hard to give intrinsic information about. And if I, if I talk, talk to you on, from a position of authority on what William Herbert does or doesn't do, I'll be lying. No, but it's a man that very few people actually know. He doesn't like exposure. He doesn't like uh, mixing with people. Um, I don't know what he was avoiding anyway. He's a, some, a guy you cannot approach anyhow. It's not uh, somebody you can uh, reach anyhow. He doesn't go to parties. I don't know. <laughs> Did you see him go to any party? No. Nope. He doesn't go to parties. He doesn't mix where there's a crowd. And uh, he was always, you know... Uh, isolated. Isolated. It's difficult for one to say exactly who he is. It's not easy to reach him, to know whatever was the truth about him. So people just uh, made up things to fit. For one who's do, who was doing music at the time, it was more about just playing his music, the way he felt it, the way he saw it, the way it came to him, and nothing more than that. He didn't do TV shows. You didn't see him in the music magazines. I cannot recall 
if he had granted any radio interview, it might have been his personality. It might have been that he wasn't used to being interviewed or he never wanted it in the first place. Or it could turn out to be a big performer with a shy approach to life. There must be something that he never wanted people to find out. I don't know. In fact, that's a, a mystery puzzle. The last I saw him, he, 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 he told me he recorded the gospel music and he would like me to go and listen to it at the studio. Why don't you meet him directly? I'll give you his phone number. I have it now. The second time when I went to visit in Enugu, I mean, he had become a, a big chief. He had also become a priest. I think he was pastoring a, a church. And he was saying to me that, oh, he left those things, and in fact, he was trying to close his studio to sell over, all, off the equipment. He's put some of those stuff behind him. Uh, unfortunately, he cannot erase it, because all this were part of his life, and he did all of this. He did the music and everything, he made the records, sang the songs, he wrote them. So he cannot just wish them away. Maybe now that he's concentrating on Christianity, he may not want to go that path again. Live a good life. Do the word of God. Read your Bible. I would like you to read James 1, verse 22 to 25. Do the word of God and live a good life. I love you all. Bye for now. You know, he's from Nigeria, but he speaks in his songs like if he's speaking to the world. I mean, he must have envisioned that the world would hear him at some point and written it with that in mind. But at the same time, he's in this small town in Nigeria. I mean, it has another worldliness. And I think that, that it probably is more suited for now than when it originally came out. And the whole concept of African electronic music, is, it is something we say and it's a, it's a really nice image, but it doesn't have to even be African, really. It's just music that really speaks to a particular time. William, we have a last laugh now. Like Fela is having a last laugh. So, and that, those are people who I call facilitators for change in society. When they start, we don't understand them, but eventually it takes time, but divine time is not human time. So <laughs> yeah, this is like 40 years after. <laughs> 